Hi, let's take a look at managerial accounting concepts. So we're not gonna switch our focus away from financial and into what is called managerial accounting. And I'm gonna review the differences with you in just a couple of slides here. First, let's take a look at what exactly managerial accounting is. It's simply a field in accounting that's gonna provide ec economic and financial information for managers and other internal users. And what the key point here is gonna be internal users. Those are gonna be people with inside the organization um, to give them information that they need to operate the business effectively and to make good business decisions. So this, for managerial accounting, we're not talking about information for use outside of the organization. And managerial accounting is going to apply to all types of businesses. So we're talking about service businesses, merchandising businesses, manufacturing businesses, and all forms of business organizations. That would mean our proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations, as well as nonprofit and profit-oriented companies. So this is a really good slide because it details pretty much the differences between financial and managerial accounting. So financial accounting is for external decision makers. Those are people outside of the organization, investors and creditors, the SEC, the government, the tax man, the IRS, unions, anyone who may want to look at a company's financial position outside of the organization will fall under financial accounting. Managerial, as we talked about just a second ago, are for people inside the organization, like managers, for that planning and control of the organization. Financial accounting is historical, right? We're recording things that are happening in the business and then we'll put out a report of the past. What happened last month, last quarter, last year? In managerial, our focus is really on the future. So let's take some of this information, let's make some projections and try to look into what's gonna happen going forward and um, what can we do obviously to make our company more profitable and successful as we go forward. The emphasis in financial accounting is on verifiability. We want to be able to document everything that occurs so we can go back and, you know, prove that it actually happened. For managerial accounting, what we're focusing on really is that planning and control function. So um, verifiability is not so important. The same with financial accounting. We're focused on precision, where t uh, managerials focus more on timeliness, getting information quickly. We might pull daily reports. We could pull hourly reports. That just does not happen in financial. For um, financial accounting, the subject is focused on the whole organization. We will prepare the financial statements for the entire company. Under managerial accounting, though, we can pull reports by division or department. So we can really get down into the weeds and get some detail for each segment of our organization. Financial is very um, not detailed. It's a very uh, big summary. We don't want to give a lot of detail because we don't want people outside the organization to have that information, particularly our creditors. Financial must follow GAAP, our generally accepted accounting principles. That's what we've been learning in the course up until now. And the managerial doesn't need to follow GAAP or any other prescribed format. We're going to review some, you know, really basic commonly used types of formats, but there is no um, necessarily prescribed format like there is in GAAP. And then financial is required for our external reporting um, that follows GAAP, and there is no mandatory reporting under managerial accounting. So I mentioned earlier, uh, managerial applies to service firms, merchandisers, and manufacturers. Let's talk about the difference between a merchandiser and a manufacturer. So a merchandiser is just a company that buys finished goods. Those are goods that are completed and ready for sale, and then they sell them. And I've got an example of Megalomart Mart here. Uh, now, your Target, your Walmarts, those are really good examples. Home Depot. 
Manufacturers, they buy raw materials. They produce then and sell finished goods. Tesla is a good example of this. They do the manufacturing themselves. You could say uh, Apple, but Apple hires other companies to do the manufacturing. So if you think of a company that actually buys the raw materials and then fabricates the product to finish it, that's a manufacturer. And we have some basic cost concepts in manufacturing that we need to review. One of those is um, the fact of what we have that are called product costs. These are all the costs that go into manufacturing a specific product. And we break those into what are called direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. So if I were to add direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead, I'm going to get the total product cost, the total costs required to make that specific product. And raw materials then are the basic direct materials that go into manufacturing, let's say, a car. So let's look at direct materials specifically. And if we were thinking about the materials that go into manufacturing a car, you might think, oh, well, we need tires, we need a radio, as it says here, you need a steering wheel, you need the um, frame, you're going to need the door panels, the lights, all sorts of different materials you can probably specifically trace to a car, and those we call direct materials. We also have something called indirect materials, and those are used in the car, but they're not necessarily easily traceable to that specific car. Or, and or sometimes they're such an insignificant part of a finished product that it's really um, not worth tracking. So when I think about a car, I think maybe the um, adhesive, where maybe they put it around the window frame, one employee might put a lot of adhesive around it. One might put a little bit. Um, lubricants for the door hinges. Those things are really hard to track. And um, they're maybe just so small and insignificant, it's not important. Another example, if you were thinking of a bakery, the grease that you use to spray inside a pan before you dump it in to help release the cake when it's done you know one employee might really spray the pan a whole lot and one might just put a nice light dusting not to mention who really wants to weigh a can of you know cooking spray before you actually use it to see just how much of it was used it would be so insignificant and so small it's not worth tracking that's what we call indirect materials Labor, um, we have two kinds, just like we have materials, direct and indirect. So direct labor is for those factory employees or those employees you can directly trace to working on that specific product. So they are directly associated with converting those raw materials into finished goods. We also have something called indirect labor. Those are for employees that it's much harder to trace their association to a specific product. Typically, our indirect labor we consider to be our supervisor salaries because they may work, be working on multiple product lines. Maintenance employees, again, um, in our factory, we may be producing multiple product lines with multiple products, and it's hard to trace our maintenance workers, how much time they're spending on each specific product line. Um, so those typically are what we would consider to be our indirect labor. Again, it's much harder to track. You can certainly tell a um, employee assembly line worker in an automobile if he's working specifically on one type of car. Now, manufacturing overhead is where we dump in all of our costs that we cannot specifically trace to a specific product. And this usually includes things like depreciation on our equipment and factory machines and on the building, insurance, taxes, maintenance on our factory facilities, and the indirect labor and indirect materials. That's where we take that indirect labor and indirect materials and we add it to what's called manufacturing overhead. So that gives us product versus period cost. So I mentioned when we started the discussion about product cost, which includes our direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. So, oops, sorry about that. What's gonna happen is that on our inventory, which is an asset, which usually carries a debit balance, 
want, as we accrue the cost to manufacture our products, they're going to sit on our balance sheet as inventory. Once we sell that finished product, we're going to credit our inventory, which will reduce our regular, what we call finished goods inventory. And we're going to transfer the cost of that those items that we just sold now to cost of goods sold, which is an expense account on our income statement. And that will sit as a debit then on our cost of goods sold. So that'll make my expense item cost of goods sold go up on my income statement, which will reduce my gross profit and ultimately my net income. But we have to keep track of the cost of the merchandise we're selling. We also have period costs. Those are what we call our selling and administrative costs. You may have also hear them referred to as SG&A expenses, selling general and administrative expenses. So those would be things like um, paying our commissions on our sales force to our, um, if we have a retail location, those would be considered selling costs or a uh, marketing budget, advertising, those are all selling. Administrative are your non-revenue generating activities like uh, accounting, legal, human resources, all those administrative costs get expensed as an incurred. So selling an administrative goes straight to our expense in the period in which incurred and will decrease our net income. Now the income statement for a manufacturer is pretty similar to that of a merchandiser, which is what we've learned before with one subtle difference. So a merchandiser or a couple. Merchandiser starts with beginning merchandise inventory that's finished and ready for sale that they bought elsewhere. They add any purchases they make during the period, subtract out any ending inventory they have on hand at the end of the period to get cost of goods sold. That's the cost of the goods that we're selling. That's all it is. The cost of the merchandise that we sold. And the manufacturer starts with beginning finished goods inventory because uh, Merchant manufacturers carry three types of inventory, raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. Finished goods are completed and ready for sale. So they start with beginning finished goods inventory. We add our cost of goods manufactured, the cost of the goods that we manufacture during the period. And then we subtract our ending finished goods, what we have on hand at the end of the period that's finished and ready for sale to calculate cost of goods sold. And the income statement then for a manufacturer, again, will vary slightly from that of a merchandiser. What we typically see for a merchandising company, oh, this is, sorry, this is just a, a different presentation of the last slide. You see it vertically um, with numbers added in here. So you can uh, go ahead and pause the video if you'd like to see that and digest it for just a second. Now in determining the cost of goods manufactured, which we just saw on our cost of goods in calculating cost of goods sold, we start with our beginning work in process inventory. So work in process is work that's been started but not yet completed. Let's go back to the Tesla example. So if we had a Tesla car that we had started into production, maybe it, um, the outside frame has been um, produced but we haven't yet painted it we haven't yet put in the motor or the seats or anything else all the specifics that's our beginning work in process inventory we're going to add to that then the total manufacturing cost during the period so my direct materials direct labor and manufacturing overhead that i've incurred during the period to get my total cost of work in process I then subtract ending work in process inventory to get my cost of goods manufactured. So let me give you a brief look at what a uh, cost of goods manufacturer schedule would look like. Start with your beginning work in process at the beginning of the year. What they had started into production that wasn't yet completed, 18,400. Then we're gonna add our direct materials, direct labor and manufacturing overhead to get total manufacturing overhead, add the um, direct materials, direct labor, and overhead to get our total manufacturing cost here, 376.8. So take beginning WIP, what we call work in process WIP, minus our ending work in process to get total cost of goods manufactured. And um, just a little tip here, how I remember what goes on my cost of goods manufactured. It starts with the word man, right? So then WIP 
So I think I always remember I'm going to whip my man. I really don't. It's just a joke. But um, yeah, so if you think man, cost of goods manufactured always starts with your beginning whip. Add your um, total manufacturing cost, subtract your ending whip to get cost of goods manufactured. Oh, here's your balance sheet for a merchandiser. So it looks identical except for this inventory category. Merchandisers only carry one category of inventory. Manufacturers carry three. Again, raw materials. Those are just the materials we're going to use in production in producing our specific item. Work in process started but not yet completed. Finished goods are completed and ready for sale. Oh, there we go. There's a nice summary for you. Okay, so here's a current asset section for a merchandising company and then for a manufacturing company. So you can just see the difference resides right here in that merchandise inventory. You will see all three categories of inventory listed for um, a manufacturing company. And also we all usually list our assets by order of liquidity. So the most liquid asset goes on the top, which is always cash because that's cash, receivables, and in this case you'll see finished goods listed first, then work in process, then raw materials because it's easiest to get money out of materials that have been completed. And the very last slide here is just to show you the flow of goods. So what happens is we take our raw materials, those get moved into our balance sheet, and as we requisition the raw materials into production, we will add labor and overhead to the raw materials to get the material completed. So all that gets added into what we call work in process. Once the items are completed, we transfer those costs into our finished goods inventory. Once the items get sold, those costs shift from our balance sheet to our income statement as cost of goods sold. And then don't forget we have our period costs, which are our selling and administrative expenses. And those will get expensed directly to the income statement as incurred. And that's it for Chapter 18. Thanks.